Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the international cooperation at the UN, what came out of the COP15 in 2022. We are streaming to YouTube live from fourth space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jajage, Montreal. Here at fourth space, we collaborate with our university community by activating the research projects and initiatives across the university through daily activities. We welcome comments and questions, so if you'd like to participate, please use the chat or raise a hand, turn on your microphone and your video, and we will be sure to get to you. If you're here in the space, also raise your hand and we'll get a mic. So it is now my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Rebecca Tidler. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be downtown in the space. I uh, was teaching until 11.30 and Dr. Emma Duplan, who's here with me as well, will be teaching at one. So, so we're squeezing this in from the other campus. Um, I do have students who are in the rooms next to us. So we're not the only ones at Loyola. Um, I hope that there are people there in person as well. I can see Sarah and Leila, uh, but I hope that there are others as well. Um, thank you for coming today in whatever form you have been able to attend. Um, we are planning a little bit of an informal discussion um, around the COP15. Uh, before we get to that, though, I did want to start with our territorial acknowledgement. I'm not going to read this out. Uh, anyone associated with Concordia has heard this ad nauseum, but it is really crucial to recognize that here in Jojage, we are in stolen, unceded land, uh, the land of the Kanyakahaga, um, who are recognized as the um, the uh, custodians of the land on which we find ourselves today. Today in particular, I want to um, recognize the, uh, and um, yeah, I guess <laughs> recognize isn't deep enough, but uh, the, the recent discovery that came out in the news um, just yesterday about uh, potentially more bodies, more unmarked graves being found in, in Kenora. Um, recognize the particular importance of traditional ecological knowledge in biodiversity conservation um, that we will be discussing, that was certainly discussed at the COP15, um, that we will just be discussing to some extent today. Um, the importance of recognizing that um, colonialist approaches have done their very best to stamp out said traditional ecological knowledge and expertise. Um, and uh, hopefully we will make some, some progress moving forward uh, in that area. But it's, it's really important also to recognize that we have colonized these lands um, by bringing you know, settlers here, um, but also in an ecological um, way that the settlers, European settlers brought their native plants and animals, um, some of which have become invasive and uh, are dominant in our urban settings as well. And so colonized uh, the land here and more than just by bringing people, but also by affecting the native biodiversity. Um, so with that, I'd like to move on and talk, uh, I'll give a little bit of a, a brief um, introduction about the COP and the Convention on Biological Diversity, and then our, I'll introduce our, our panelists today. We have um, Professor Emma Desplan, who is an entomologist in the Department of Biology here, um, also very interested in conservation and sustainability through her research and her personal uh, personal life as well. Um, Professor Ta Sarah Turner, who's with the, the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment here at Concordia University. Sarah is also the co-director of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center, of which Emma is also a member and I am the coordinator. Um, and Sarah does research on, uh, on primates in particular, but in, in animal behavior. And then Leila is joining us as well. Uh, Leila is a PhD student in uh, the lab of Dr. Monica Mulrainen in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment. And I hope that she'll tell us a little bit more about her work um, through today's discussions. I also note that um, there are quite a few people I know in the audience who have great expertise as well. So I'd like to invite you to interrupt, add, contribute to the conversation at any time. Um, I appreciate that people don't necessarily have their cameras on. When we have our cameras on, it does use um, 
data. And so there is a, a greater environmental footprint. Um, but when you speak, if you could turn your camera on, that would be great. Um, you can just raise your hand and, and I'd be more than happy to hear from anybody, any of our other experts or, or participants in the audience as well. Um, so the COP15 occurred at a very inconvenient time for, for all universities. <laughs> but you know, the United Nations doesn't ask us when they will on these things, nor should they. Um, the COP15 uh, was the convention of the parties uh, for the Convention on Biological Diversity. So different from the COP27, which is around climate, which happened in Egypt this year, in Glasgow last year. Um, the COP15 uh, met in Montreal, um, the first meeting since 2018 because of the pandemic was supposed to meet in uh, in China, in Kunming. Um, but because of the pandemic, that was postponed and postponed until finally we were able to meet here. Um, the conference occurred from December 9th to, or 7th to 19th, so flat in the middle of final exam period here at Concordia. Um, it was live streamed, I believe, for the first time. So not all of the discussions, but a lot of the formal discussions were live streamed and probably are still available as recordings on YouTube. Uh, mind you, the side events were not necessarily live streamed, and some of the most important discussions that happen happen in smaller rooms, <laughs> that, you know, in the middle of the night um, for people who are coming from around the world uh, and on different different time time scales or not time scales, but time zones. Um, but uh, but the main large um, uh, uh, events um, did occur and we're live streamed online. This is what the conference looked like. First conference I've been to where the, the conference swag bag included uh, three boxes of, uh, two boxes of masks and three boxes of test kits. Everybody had to test for COVID every day. Um, conference was held at the Palais de Congrès and there were an incredible number of people there. So the Convention on Biological Diversity came out of the, age, uh, um, the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. Um, came into effect in 1994. I believe there are currently 196 countries party to the Convention on Biological Diversity. There are four exceptions, which are Andorra, Iraq, Somalia, and the United States, who are not party to the convention. The United States at least still did have representatives. I don't know about Somalia, Iraq, and Andorra, I have to admit, but the US was, was uh, present at COP. There were some American representatives there. Um, but what's happening here in this picture on the right is that um, we have the discussions of the COP documents um, that are occurring with observers, like we were uh, international, uh, we have a, an observer status. Uh, there are NGOs that have observer status academics, uh, indigenous peoples, et cetera. Um, and then the actual delegates, two or three people from each party country um, who are negotiating the actual text of the, the agreements that come out of, out of, uh, out of these, these meetings. Um, so what came out of COP15 uh, was a, quite a brown, groundbreaking protocol, the first one that we've had since the IT protocol, which was 2010 to 2020. Um, so this protocol is to um, get us towards uh, 2030 and towards 2050. Uh, it's the Kunming Montreal protocol uh, and was um, kind of uh, uh, groundbreaking in many ways as we will discuss um, today. The text itself, I'm just trying to stop sharing my screen. Oop. Okay, I uh, don't know if that worked. Um, the text itself is really available online so anyone can take a look at it. I personally am still processing the whole event uh, and what came out of it and we will see what came out of it. Um, but I wanted to, um, to start maybe with just a question for our panelists about what they think the most important thing to come out of this, um, this protocol and this conference was. We don't have an order chosen and I can't see you <laughs> right now and my screen has somehow frozen. So I'm going to ask um, Dr. Desplan to maybe start us off. What do you think was the most important thing that came out of this? Let's see about diversity. Um, so I think the first step is that there's a very strong scientific um, consensus 
that protecting biodiversity is essential for stabilizing the climate and both stabilizing the climate and protecting biodiversity are essential for meeting the sustainability goals and you know maintaining a certain level of quality of life on earth. And this is not only in a vague way, but that we've also actually got concrete targets. So that idea of protecting 30% of the land, sea, and water by 2030, which is in seven years, um, is linked to the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit of warming. So I guess what I'm saying is that first of all, we have good solid scientific evidence of what the problems are and, and also what we need to do to solve them. And this includes both natural sciences, but there's also been quite a lot of social sciences understanding, you know, we've had agreements in the past, they failed, why, and what can we do to do better next time? One of the key things that's come out of that is concrete um, targets with numbers and dates, and we have those. So there is a way forward. And, you know, this agreement is not perfect. It has limitations, but it's the strongest one we've ever had. Um, and if we do manage to meet it and, we look like we've got better tools for meeting it than we have in the past, um, then that's very helpful. Thanks, Emma. Sarah, are you still there? I cannot see you. Hi, I'm still here. <laughs> Sarah, Leila, do you want to just jump in? What do you think was the most important thing that came out of this? I agree with what Emma said, and I guess I would add to it. Um, I thought it was important that um, that indigenous voices were prioritized in a number of the targets and that equity was discussed also in those targets um, and you know equity for marginalized voices participating in um, in the decision making more actively in the future um, the other i mean this sort of a small sounding thing but i think it was really important that they discussed representative ecosystems from a kind of biology perspective, this seemed like a really important thing that that was foregrounded um, because it means that the, the most important um, ecosystems in terms of biological diversity, in terms of um, non-degraded systems also have to be represented in that 30%. And they talked about restoration too, which is, which is also an important component. Um, for me, I am going to speak to the limitations of the agreement. <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a prerogative of my uh, generation to see the limitations first because we are the first generation that is actually heavily affected by climate change. And I am from Iran, a country that is being heavily affected by climate change. Precipitation is becoming less and less and we have severe water scarcity issues in that region as well as in North uh, Africa. So that's why I would like to talk about two issues. One is um, the commodification of oceans, which was very strong in this COP because uh, I, I work and my research is at the land sea interface, so I look a lot at coastal and uh, marine environments and um, the oceans are being um, sort of looked at as a source of CO2 sink, but also a place where a lot of money can be made. And a lot of these big corporations are now looking at the oceans as a, as a not a living system of relationships and, um, and, and life, basically, but as a place to make a lot of money. And um, the other issue um, that I would like to touch on is we need to be very careful as researchers and scientists that that 30% uh, by 2030 needs, we need to be careful that the rest of our planet cannot become a sacrificial zone. Only conserving 30% doesn't mean that we are going to have, the, it provide the opportunity for, um, ecosystem services to, to, to you know, continue uh, sustaining our lives. And um, I feel like that was something that wasn't really discussed in, in the COP much. And I mean, the drivers of biodiversity loss were barely touched upon in the COP, which was really disappointing. I mean, there was a strong presence of corporations there and very, very little talk about how we can actually stop 
destroying all these important natural ecosystems that are still there. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's me for now. Sorry, I talked a lot. Yeah, no, that's great. Can, can I maybe yep. answer something, Layla? I think, what, Layla, what you're saying about the drivers is really important. Um, I was favorably impressed to see that they were actually mentioned in the IPBS report. So for maybe being too technical, the, the IBPS report, um, let's see, um, the, the report that kind of led to the COP. So it's it's the sort of scientific summary of what's happening to biodiversity and how is biodiversity providing services to people. And for the first time, it mentions all the indirect drivers. So saying clearly that things like overconsumption and globalization are leading to biodiversity loss. And to me, that was exciting that it was actually in there because for you know, most of my lifespan, that's kind of been a marginal environmentalist kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. And that and it's actually put out there as like, no, this is accepted fact, this is what happening is new. But you're absolutely right that it didn't get that much present, that much visibility at COP15. And it wasn't discussed as much as it should have been. Um, I don't know if this is a glass half full, half empty kind of debate, but yeah, there is text about overconsumption, reducing overconsumption, reducing waste, reducing food waste specifically, which I think is very interesting in the actual protocol um, that came out of this um, first time that 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 has been, um, you know, explicitly in anything as far as I remember. <laughs> uh, so much, you know, really recognizing that they standard of living and the lifestyle of those living in the minority world or the developed world um uh that we have to look at that as a as a as a driver of biodiversity loss for sure the number one cause of biodiversity loss is habitat loss right we know that so it's land use change in the in the protocol document um there is you know one mention in one of the targets of invasive species, uh, over cons overconsumption is in a couple, um, uh, but um, land use change, you know, how are we gonna address issues of land use change? Is there a food versus the environment type issue still? Um, there are, is lots of verbiage around sustainably managing our biodiversity, sustainably managing our natural resources, but what does that mean and how do we do that and continue to feed, you know, almost nine, Eight, nine billion people in the world you know those details are not in here this is the much longer however than the the protocol than the the predecessor which was the IT um protocol uh so there is more detail <laughs> um, but obviously it's not perfect I was so struck I mean it's the first cop that I've attended I was struck by the consensus model. That is all of these people in the room, all of those 196 parties, they have to agree on every word that goes in here. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, you know, the chair of those committees, amazing, amazing people chairing those committees who, you know, will send, I want Ireland and the Bahamas to go to a corner and figure this out because <laughs> they're not, because they're not agreeing, you know, and anybody else who wants to be on this discussion over this one word, go figure it out. So it's not going to be perfect being a consensus, a global consensus model. Um, uh, and I see other other issues uh, with it as well, but I should let others speak first. Um, Sarah, do you have do you have um, ideas about what could have been better about what came out of the COP? Do you have criticisms? Yeah, I, yes, <laughs> I do as well. Um, but I wanted to echo what you were just saying um, about the facilitation wizards who were the chairs of those sessions. It was amazing watching them work and this kind of editing at a global scale where they had, you know, paragraphs and brackets and words and options and then going through in this huge room and calling on the representatives just by country and and the nitty gritty of editing all of that as a consensus process with the kind of magician chair at the top facilitating that was was incredible to watch and i you know there were kind of like little dorky jokes that would spread through the room somebody would make about editing but it was it was kind of fascinating to watch that process and see how consensus editing can work at a global scale on the 
you know, they would call on countries, I really felt like there was all this talk about Indigenous voices, and yet Indigenous nations are not represented at those tables. It's only by country, that is all, and that seems really problematic to me. So in terms of, you know, moving forward, just representatives by countries does not does not cover the voices that need to be part of that consensus process and that's that's really a problem there were kind of when the most poignant thing that i experienced through the conference was getting to know some of the indigenous rainforest activists from the west coast of canada who brought this giant piece of douglas fir tree um, to the to the cop and um, this like slice, they called it the cookie, and um, 750 year old piece of Douglas fir, and then watching, seeing people from around the world react to this piece of old growth forest that had been recently clear cut in Canada, and and the indigenous folks who brought it, they're activists. They had um, a lot of amazing things to say, but they weren't given any substantial voice at this whole event as you know examples and their ceremonial drums were taken away at the security desk every single day that they came which was just you know they experienced as a really big slap in the face and very disrespectful and they talked all of them talked about the, the experience of that like tangible disrespect coming in the door and these sort of this lip service paid to wanting indigenous voices to be present in in the COP meetings, and then the practical on the ground, here were Indigenous people who'd come from across Canada with a message to bring to these meetings, and then not, not getting a lot of platform to speak, and having their drums taken away, and, and decreed as weapons, which was, you know, ridiculous. So, um, but okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> I'll pass the mic to someone else. Can I, am I the someone else, or? <clears throat> yeah, okay. So I'm 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 not checking my phone for messages. I'm actually trying to find the name of this event that I went to, which was chaired by the US and it was about the oceans. And um it's interesting that um at this event, it was a side event of course, there was um a lot of talk about oh my god indigenous knowledge how important it is to save it how important it is to for it to be integrated and reflected into um, management of natural resources and natural environments not a single indigenous person in the room not just not a single and this is not a person of color like unless we consider me a person of color which i i, I kind of not but like no indigenous representative and this was I went to a lot of side events and this happened in multiple side events when they were speaking of indigenous knowledge and its importance and not a single indigenous person in the room and these are government officials like it or not cop is a states club it's like we are at the mercy of the state and um not having these voices present was jarring to me I mean you would have indigenous peoples presenting their cases of, for example, at the Canada Pavilion, there were multiple events about IPCAs, which are indigenous protected and conserved areas, and the indigenous folks themselves were there and they were presenting their cases. But when it came to um, side events and negotiating rooms, I mean, they weren't really, they weren't really there. And I did go to multiple negotiating events and rooms and um, I, try to participate in the early morning caucus meeting of the indigenous folks and um it just it was a little bit um not a little very disappointing to not have these peoples in the rooms where they're they are being used as as post as, as like a poster of oh look how progressive and amazing we are and um or look how much we care where we, where, I mean, they, they, um, I don't wanna use these words, but it was very, very sad and very depressing to not have a stronger presence of um, communities that are actually conserving the majority of the biodiversity of our planet. And um, there was also this issue with the funding mechanisms of, um, 
of the UN, where there was um, disagreements because they wanted to change the mechanisms of the Global Environmental Fund or, or GEF. And um, the and Global South countries were very much adamant on having, like changing this mechanism because it is not working. There's so much bureaucracy involved and money gets stuck in these international transactions and it doesn't get to the communities that are actually on land and working and it goes to the state and then states makes makes a decision about where this money should go and um the um big bigger big bigger funders of of jeff including in germany um france and a couple of other european countries they were like, we're not even going to discuss this until the next COP. Like, this is not even like, until COP 16, we're not even gonna discuss changing a mechanism that is inherently flawed and is not working. And so that was rather jarring to me. Like it was something that I f followed a bit and it was very, anyways, so. <laughs> But there were some amazing things going on in the COP as well. <laughs> so, yeah, not I'm with you, Leila. I was Boom. paying close attention to who was at the table and also to the verbiage and the actual protocol that came out. Um, in the IT protocol, which was the predecessor to this, there was one mention of Indigenous peoples and uh, one of traditional ecological knowledge. In this protocol, there are 20 mentions of Indigenous people and eight of traditional ecological knowledge. It's definitely progress. But we need to make sure that that's not lip service. Um, the, uh, the the 30 by 30, that's target three, um, that talks about conserving 30% of terrestrial inland and coastal and marine areas by 2030, which is um, a leap from where we are now. We, the IG target was 17% terrestrial and inland waters and 10% uh, marine, and we didn't quite meet that. Um, so it's it's a, it's a jump. Um, but the verbiage talks about ecologically representative, which is great, which means we can't, you know, conserve everything in the desert. <laughs> we need 30% of the desert, but we also need 30% of Canada's Niagara Peninsula, for example, uh, where there are lots of people. Uh, Well-connected, so not to connectivity, great. Equitably governed systems of protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. So no mention specifically of indigenous managed areas there, but there's room for it at least. Recognizing indigenous and traditional territories where applicable. So what does it mean to recognize? And who decides where it's applicable? Or what is applicable when? Um, there's, there's, there's trouble there. It's, it's progress for sure, um, but uh, there's certainly certainly work to be done and having the voices that are you know referred to multiple times in this protocol actually at the table. Um, we can hope for the future, but we're not there yet. Do you have something to add? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of this ties back to that original concern about those drivers. So the recognition that there are drivers linked to you know globalized, capitalism and overconsumption and, and our whole system of well, our economic system and our trade system is what's driving biodiversity loss. It's also something that's deeply ingrained and is going to be hard to change. And so, for example, the question of funding is tied into this, that, you know, many of the most biodiversity rich countries are also the ones that are um, previously colonized and are now low income countries. And so how do we get a fair way to protect their biodiversity without driving them further into poverty, for instance. Um, and I know there was a lot of conversation about that. And that's where I think as Layla mentioned, there were the real bones of contention that were not resolved. Um, and I have to admit, this is an issue that I have very, very little expertise in. So I wasn't paying too much attention, but, but I do get it that this is a big problem and we need to move forward on that. Um, and how we're gonna do it is hard because we're addressing you know, deep issues of inequality. Um, maybe a smaller example too of one thing that was not mentioned in there. I think Rebecca was saying about how one of the main drivers is habitat loss. That's linked to agriculture. It's specifically linked to animal agriculture. Um, and this is one thing that the COP agreement was 
criticized for is not mentioning that, you know, if we want to meet both food security and protecting biodiversity, eating less animal products is a big part of that. Um, and it's those of us in, you know, the developed countries who are driving that. Um, and why is it not mentioned? It's powerful economic interests. So it's again, those drivers that are being hard to, to address. Yeah, um, the 30% uh, thirty percent by 2030, we also have to um, make sure that, that it does not turn into a lab gra land grab of indigenous territories, <laughs> right? And I laugh, but not because it's funny, just because we've been there before and we've been there for a long time. We saw that with Red Plus programs um, that ended up being, you know, privatization of carbon resources that benefited the rich and allowed them to continue to pollute and degrade habitat and, and, and release carbon into the atmosphere while, you know, in some cases, uh, excluding indigenous peoples from the lands that they had sustainably managed um, for generations. Um, so we need to make sure that the 20, the 30 by 2030 um, does not come at the expense of, of indigenous land rights. And there is some verbiage around, around that in the, in the, uh, in the actual protocol. Um, but it's still something that we need to keep very much uh, front front of mind um, in moving forward. Sarah, go ahead. Um, I mean, it all kind of, or a lot of this comes down to implementation and, and how, and I got very tired after COP of seeing media reports that said, and now the real work begins, but it wasn't really clear. <laughs> how any of that work was going to happen or how like the, just the you know it's good to lay this out but it's, it's it seems to be a pro an ongoing problem with with these kinds of processes that we get a nice vision even if it's problematic in various ways but we start to get a consensus vision and consensus wording and then actually taking that and implementing it into real world change it's it's like there's this wicked problem and we outline the vision but not the path to it and the targets are you know a little bit closer vision that they're a little bit more concrete <laughs> vision but there's still a real gap between those targets and the how to get there and it and that seems like something that needs to be discussed with as much investment and fervor and interest at a global scale as as the it's like we we now the the next step should be also as big a deal and not just kind of okay now we go do it go forth i mean i don't know it seems kind of not possible so yeah just Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, target 14, 15, and 18 are really interesting, especially target 15, where it, if, I think for the first time that I'm seeing in any COP event, be it the UN CCD, um, CBD, or the UNFCCC, that there is um, an actual target to take legal, administrative, or policy measures to properly monitor corporations and what they're doing, which was great because um, when these documents are taken to each separate state and then they go through their judicial process or whatever, their um, um, parliamentary process, and then they are adopted or ratified or whatever they are in that country, um, they can change it to, to fit their systems of um, what is conservation, what is measuring conservation, and um, and how do we um, actually, you know, monitor these corporations or these big businesses. And having that actual wording and those words of like legal administrative policy measures in this document is great because they are very they can have very literal translations in different languages and different countries. So um, it can actually um, probably have a great effect on on 
uh, looking at how these corporations, these multinational corporations, are working in different countries and have a more have a more unified approach to how we monitor them. For example, if we if we talk of um, uh, was it Texaco recently that um, a report was published, a, a research study was published by Harvard showing that this um, corporation, this oil corporation, had made very shockingly accurate um, uh, predictions on how climate change would look like in the next 40 years, and this research was done in the 70s. And so, um, ex yes, yeah. And so it's, it's um, having these words that can have like sort of like each country that has a representative, for example, from whatever corporation in their country, and we can look at them at the same level and stop them from ad adapting to the lowest level. And um, yeah, I have a big issue with oil because I am a child of oil. I come from Iran and um, we are not an economy based on tax. We're an oil based economy. So. Um, oil is a big issue to me and um, having words that can actually control and level the field are, are in my opinion, great. So, Yeah, thank you, Leila. I just wanted to, just so that we're all on the same page, target 14 in the, in the protocol talks about ensuring integration of biodiversity and biodiversity values into policies, regulation, planning, and development, um, poverty eradication strategies, et cetera, environmental assessment. Uh, target 15 um, is about uh, taking legal administrative or policy measures, so a choice, but still legal is there, uh, to encourage and enable businesses, particularly large transnational companies and financial institutions, to report on, monitor, um, and disclose um, their dependencies and impacts on biodiversity, provide this information to consumers. Uh, and report on uh, on compliance with the, with the CBD. Um, and uh, target 16 is about consumption and encouraging and uh, ensuring that people can make sustainable consumption choices. So those are three things that have not been strong in previous uh, previous um, uh, agreements. Um, so really interesting to see them here. Uh, and potential implications for Canada. What do we think? Mm -hmm. There's also verbiage around um, phasing out uh, subsidies for um, practices that are harmful to biodiversity, which has implications for Canada, I would think. Um, anybody else see what the implications of this might be for Canada? I think it can enhance the IPCA process, the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas process under the 30 by 2030, which is great. And there's already a lot of funding becoming available for this across Canada. So, um, yeah. And I do hope that we see more explicit reference to biodiversity loss and biodiversity issues in in policy and in our, you know, upcoming legislations, and more um, co-managed conservation areas, and you know, hopefully the these targets will give some kind of strength to those to bringing forth these issues in a lot of different a lot of different policy venues. Yeah, I. I don't know if it's answering the question, but um, I was happy to see Canadian politicians and you know Quebec politicians there, so that they were hearing this message that biodiversity protection is not a kind of minor fringe environmentalist issue. It's a big deal. It's important. It should be central, and the whole rest of the world is agreeing that it's central. So I find often some of our political discourse is like twenty years out of date on this. Um, you know, I had been at COP15 hearing everybody talking about how important biodiversity is and we need to protect it and all this, this very kind of constructive, positive view. And then I took the Metro home and there was that little news flash about how the Premier of Ontario thinks he can cut into the green belt around Toronto because it's not really necessary. And just the, 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 the disconnect 
between the, the, the level at which what we're talking was kind of a shock. I said, like, what is this guy? Hasn't he been listening? I was like, no, he hasn't been sitting on COP15 all day. And maybe he should have been. Um, so I'm hoping it's maybe making Canadian decision makers more aware that this is important. Um, or it's giving perhaps more, I guess, re-energizing Canadian citizens to push their decision makers to realize you need to act on this. Um, yeah. Yeah, here in Montreal, it is uh, good to see a commitment to, to, to 30 by 2030 um, uh, from, from the Plant Administration, um, which is great. I think that we need to be careful to uh, consider issues of eco-gentrification, um, poverty reduction, along with that conservation. Um, so I'll be I'll be interested to see how that moves here in Montreal, where we have a, a housing shortage, and we know that access to green space uh, should be a right for all. Also increases property values, and so can lead to gentrification. Um, we need to see those go hand in hand: the poverty reduction and uh, uh, access to housing equity, etc., um, along with with the conservation. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Sarah and Leila, what do you think? The local, more local implications. Um, I I observed a I don't know irony at the conference that is in those photos. But the very first night, I was walking through. I'd stayed late for a side event and was walking through the mostly empty buildings, and walked past some of the more closed room discussions where staff were were throwing out plates and plates of cut meat and cheese into the garbage um, at the end of this event. And, and then, you know, to have the, this target come out, which is to reduce food waste. So it, I guess it's, it's, it is, it's, it's the translating these big ideas into local actions and into really like, you know, changing how we do things individually as an org as organizations as a conference organization as governments as you know as concordia working at you know, kind of all the scales to to implement some of this is seems important and having conversations about the how the how to do that All right, I guess I should open it up at some point and now seems like a good time to open it up for, for questions, comments, uh, insights from our experts who are in the audience or from those who do not consider themselves experts but definitely have switched <laughs> so I can see. Maria, go ahead. Oh, you may not be Maria. Sorry, I have a, a room full of My name is William, time. but I, I think I could go into <laughs> Maria if I could ask a question. So the question I have is the dominant economic system that we're working in is globalization. Were there any serious discussions about working groups to try to look at what a fiasco and a disaster this economic system has been for the environment? And the, the second question would be, a lot of the countries that are severely impacted, like Bangladesh and some of these other countries, are asking for compensation for the mess. Um, so those are two thematic questions. Um, I, I, I guess they're fairly serious. Thank you. Does anyone want to take that? Or I can. In terms of compensation and, and finances, there were uh, $200 billion a year of public and private funding that were committed. Canada committed over $1.5 billion a year and some of that is is for compensation some of it is mitigation some of it is um to help implement uh implement conservation and and, and associated strategies and uh, so there has been you know more funding than ever <laughs> uh available for these kinds of things uh the 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 as Layla, I believe, uh, discussed the mechanism through which the, the funding uh, is provided was very controversial. Uh, at one point, um, all of Africa, Indonesia, and seven of the Latin American countries walked out 
of negotiations over the vehicle for funding. Um, the funding is going to be put in the Global Environment Fund, which has been criticized for being incredibly bureaucratic, not functioning very well, being very inaccessible, particularly to Indigenous groups, et cetera. So we'll see how that works, but the funds are being committed um, at least. Um, anybody else? In the chat, there's a related oh. question about involving the private sector. Yeah, is there, uh, so related question is, has there been discussion about involving the private sector to find strategies towards protecting the environment? So the $200 billion is, is supposed to come from the private as well as the public sector, so for sure. And then uh, also the the uh, the target uh, 15, I believe it is, which is about um, the about transnationals, at least, and, and companies reporting. Uh, and and providing uh, providing information on their effects and their dependencies on biodiversity. Um, the other part of your question, William, I lost track of. <laughs> um, do you want to repeat the first part, William? I got distracted by the funding. All right. Hello. Uh, Nicolas Chevalier, student, but also a member of Climate Just Montreal. I didn't get to be in the room of COP15, but I was at most of the side events uh, by Indigenous youth, which I think we were 10 people in a room for 500, so kind of sad. Uh, but also, like they said, well, first of all, personal grievance, apologies, but you needed masks and rapid tests to be in COP15. Uh, we're at another peak in the pandemic right now, even though nobody wants to say it. We don't need masks, nor we need rapid tests of students. So are our lives worth less than delegates? Uh, so about the COP15, I was part of the organizing committee for the protest against it. I didn't participate in the march itself, but I did take a walk after and saw where the $15 million in police uh, suppression, let's say it, uh, was invested because there were less than 300 people in that march and there were over 250 police officers, even more than that. So that's part of it too, who gets to access the room. And as I understand it, Indigenous nations do not have a uh, say in what changes in the wording of anything. They are still only observers, unless that was adopted in the final text. There were about a billion brackets left before the last night when they spent all night up. Uh, here I hold a pamphlet, which is only in French right now because I've given away all the English versions. It is called Hoodwinked in the Hot House, made by a lot of these frontline communities, including La Via Campesina, but also Indigenous Climate Action and Indigenous Environmental Network, which were uh, participants or observers, whatever, at this conference. And uh, to be clear about what was said before, not a single target has been met on any of these comps on biodiversity, not a single one. So excuse me if my belief in this all this beautiful language is that it's going to go down to nothing. And the fact that the corporations are there and what the private sector should do is disappear. I'm oh, sorry, I'm an anarchist also, so I'm not a big fan of capitalism, colonialism, globalism, or whatever the hell you want to call the powers that be, which also when we talk about individual solutions, uh, Ask a student, ask somebody who's trying to make ends meet if you're paying $700 for a one and a half in a city that should not be that expensive. You don't have time to care about tending a garden, making sure your plastic bags are, you know, recycled or whatever. And the onus has to be on corporations that thrive on these things. All that food. Yeah. It's Thank you, Nicola. I'm going to. I'm going to cut you off there. You brought up a lot of really good points, issues of equity, issues of funding, yep. issues of representation, all really, really important. Um, you also brought up the point that from the IT protocol, not a single one of those targets was met. Uh, no one country met well, no one country met all of the targets. Um, the big uh, goal was 17% uh, conservation by by 2020, 17% of terrestrial uh, and inland marine and inland uh, um, water systems and 10% of marine. We did not meet those goals. However, there was certainly progress made, uh, and the IT targets, you know, did did lead to um, and and justify efforts. Again, not perfect. Um, we did not make all of the progress in the world, but I would argue that um, that we need to have these conversations go as imperfect as they are. <laughs>
every semester. I can maybe add to that for four years. Sorry, Alexandra, we can't. Oh, sorry. Uh, Emma, I think I had something to add. Go ahead. I did just want to add that maybe part of the value of having these agreements is now that you know country leaders have committed in public to see certain targets, it makes it easier for the people to hold them to it. And to, and to put pressure to say, look, you said you would do this. Um, we need to move on it. And, and it's unfortunate that this means that democracy is really hard work um, and often very boring. Um, and yes, ideally they should just, you know, meet the targets on their own. This is probably not gonna happen. And so it is kind of up to us to push them. Um, and and I, I think universities have a big role to play there, but maybe leave it for someone else. Sarah and Leila, do you have something else to add? Um, so about the um, um, voices, indigenous voices in the room, um, I am an honorary member of an organization called the ICCA Consortium, which is an indigenous and uh, community conserved areas and territories consortium. It's a global consortium. It has uh, members from all around the world, and they were very strongly present there. There was a lot of negotiations going on with different delegates from different countries to push through uh, issues that are extremely important to indigenous communities around the world. And there were multiple other um, consortium type or global initiative type groups present there that were working very closely with different delegates and um, managed to push through wordings or, you know, putting a comma somewhere that can make a huge difference. And so um, I did say that Indigenous voices were not very strongly present in, um, or not present at all, in uh, side events, but the caucuses and the different organizations that are working closely with these um, communities all around the world were there, and they were working closely all night, taking notes, pushing through legislation on WhatsApp, and um, about the other issue that you touched uh, uh, of being, uh, you know, being able to, the very fact that you can sit here and say these things is, a, a, and all of us sitting here and saying these things is a huge privilege. Like we are in different like countries in the world that you cannot talk about these issues freely. They're, they cannot be discussed. Issues of, um, and, you know, taking care of our genetic diversity of whatever plants or whatever um, research, genetic resources are extremely political and people can't talk about these things. And so um, we have to constantly remind ourselves that this is a global setting and and some things that may seem um, redundant or useless to us are extremely important in other parts of the world. In some parts of the world, this is the only documents that indigenous folks or local communities can use to advocate for their rights or sustainable development may seem something that doesn't work here in the global north and it's just some word that is thrown around but in some parts of the world it's the only thing that people can actually hold on to you have to like this is an, an incredibly important issue and that's why i think that events like the cop are crucial maybe not to us here but in in other parts of the world it's the only thing and they're needed can I, I, I don't say this to placate or anything, but one thing that I did find really hopeful just being there, walking through and seeing there were so many people from so many parts of the world and there were so many people there who really, really very knowledgeable people, very concerned people, people putting, you know, so much effort into making change and making positive change for the world and that in itself just being kind of in that energy and in that environment and hearing people speak you know on panels and there would be you know people from eight different regions of the world represented on a single panel and all of those people speaking so articulately and so knowledgeably about their own circumstance about the kind of broader picture 
and so I mean it is there there are so many things we can criticize about these processes and about uh, about the outcomes but there that it's itself that energy and that effort is is very hopeful to me to see that happening and to just kind of see that effort of so many people doing good work trying to work to to reduce biodiversity loss to you know turn around climate change to make the environment sustainable <laughs> our, our relationship with the environment sustainable so that was hopeful to me thanks sarah i've got a question on zoom from maria you've been so patient so students who are in the next room <laughs> to me so i'm not sure it's maria who actually has the question uh, but but go ahead if you can i'm not sure if your mic works hello can you hear us yes hello? it's hannah that's asking Hi. me a question <laughs> So I just had a question about um, linking um, loss of biodiversity and um, conservation uh, sustainable goals. Um, how, in light of like the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, because I know that was also a wicked problem that arose, um, how do you, like say if COVID or another pandemic or a strain of COVID comes along, like how will that impact how biodiversity loss is handled and how other sustainable issues are handled um, on top of this other wicked problem that's co-occurring. Um, I mean, I, I can maybe say, um, I, I was kind of aware of the SARS epidemic in 2004. This put this on my radar of, of like novel diseases. Um, so in some ways with COVID-19, we've been fortunate that it wasn't worse that it was, um, you know, in terms of how virulent it is. But there's a very, so this was no, you know, we've known for 20 years this was going to happen and it has happened. Um, we know that it's, there's a direct link between habitat destruction and biodiversity loss and the emergence of new diseases. So we understand those mechanisms. Um, we understand them now better than we did two years ago because COVID has driven a lot of research into this. And I think there's more awareness of it. Um, so certainly on the list of the ecosystem services we get from impact biodiversity, preventing new diseases is, or, you know, the absence of new diseases is one of the big ones. Um, is this going to motivate people to take the biodiversity problem more seriously? Um, I don't know. And I'm not sure that answers your question. Because I think you maybe hit it the other way around. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in there. Yeah, I was, I was very interested. Like, Sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Um, like, I was just wondering, like, if, is COVID-19 kind of like an opportunity uh, for like governments and corporations to take action on? Um, like, does it does it give them that motivation to take action on other issues um, because they have those like uh, problem solving skills that they used from the COVID-19 crisis and then they can channel that motivational energy into other things or is it more of like, is COVID-19 more of like a hindrance upon taking action? I would hope it was an opportunity. I mean, we did see global emissions go way, way down in 2020. And I think in 2020, there was hope that people would realize maybe we can consume less, maybe we don't need to be transporting goods around the world, we can produce locally, maybe we can cut back on all this, you know, overconsumption and, and high levels of emissions. That doesn't seem to have played out. Um, I uh, was very interested to see one of the targets in the Kunming Montreal Protocol that came out of the COP uh refer to the importance of urban people living in urban areas having access to green and blue space um and i do wonder whether the experience of the minority world you know those those first 2020 times when we were in lockdown and we all so many people decided that they needed to go outside and have access to parks um, whether that played into uh, the inclusion of that target or not, I don't know. But I feel like a lot of uh, urban residents 
at least here, are suddenly more interested in biodiversity conservation, more interested in making sure that they have access to, to green space and more cognizant of the importance, I guess, of that access. Sarah and Leila, did you have anything to add? No, oh, okay. Um, so we have, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, just because I would maybe draw attention in the chat, there's a conversation between um, two faculty yeah. members in biology <laughs> about compensation. Um, yeah, Pedro, do you want to, do you want to talk? Do you want to unmute yourself? Are you at Leila? But there's someone, is, oh, that, that's Jochen. is that Jochen with his hand up? <laughs> Yeah, may I ask two questions, please? Uh, one is that I think there's a, um, how much were instruments talked about other than funding? Like for me, environmental impact assessment comes to mind. Was that even a topic? Because I think that's every time there's a new driver put into place, it should be much, much stronger. And biodiversity treatment and environmental impact assessment has been criticized heavily for decades, and it's not much improving. It should improve now. <laughs> urgently and the second one is um how important are the side events are they just ornamental to the cop 15 or how important are they i i, I can uh address that maybe very quickly instruments were not discussed very much there is at least one mention of environmental impact assessment in the final protocol <laughs> so uh, i and maybe say that the international negotiations don't talk much about instruments because it's up to every country to do it their own way. Um, but there were smaller side events, um, you know, local Canadian events to talk about how what instruments would be relevant in Canada. Um, and maybe those events were happening in other countries as well, one might hope. Um, on that note, I'm I'm afraid I just looked at the clock at the time and my one o'clock meeting. <laughs> has arrived and I know we're all squeezing this in between our uh, our teaching and, and class uh, um, obligations and all of the other obligations of our lives so I did promise that we would end by one and we're already a little bit over um, so I apologize for cutting the discussion short uh, when we first started talking about this discussion we thought well maybe we don't have enough to say yet and then we started the discussion and discovered that we had an awful lot <laughs> um, so, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, so I would like to thank all of you for coming. Um, thank our panelists for sharing. Um, do stay tuned. This discussion, you know, the, the December was recently. Um, we'll see what comes out of this. Um, I'll be following for sure. And I hope that, that you will be too. Um, and, you know, I have, I have a ton of questions uh, still unanswered myself. Um, but uh, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, so thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to Force Space for hosting us. Um, wonderful and and so appreciated as always. Thank you to Rebecca um, for organizing. Thank you, Rebecca. Not very organized, but, but thank you for it happen. Everybody um, here in person. <laughs> all right. So I wish you a great day, everybody, and um, we will hope to continue the conversation in the future. We may continue the conversation as part of our conference, Sustainability Disciplines, uh, Cross Disciplines Conference, which will be March 13th to 17th. Um, the theme of this year's conference is uh, sustainability, biodiversity, and justice. Um, so very fitting. So hopefully we can continue this conversation and many others at that time. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. We are going to go ahead and close up the Zoom. Uh, but just a reminder that this was being live streamed to YouTube, so it'll be available to rewatch immediately after this.